Prayer flags and yaks at Niapsola Pass. As our caravan climbs the Himalayas to the mystic land of lost horizons, forbidden Tibet. Devil dancers at the world's largest monastery, where every turn of the wheel sends hundreds of prayers to Buddha. Lhasa's summer festival beneath the gold roof palace of the Dalai Lama, God King of Tibet. His palace, the Potala, in Shangri-La. I adventure with Lowell Thomas. This world of lofty mountains is dominated by a lofty religious mysticism, the creed of Buddha, whom the poet Sir Edwin Arnold called the light of Asia. Central Asian Plateau. We're at the edge of Central Asia, on the Indian side of the Himalayas. These are Buddhist monks who, like their brethren in hundreds of monasteries, are praying for the deliverance of their spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, who lives in a land that not long ago was overrun by the red tide, by the Chinese communists, who deny even the existence of a supreme being. The Tibetans, as you know, are an exceedingly religious people, also peace-loving, and they live in a country so strange that Westerners who visit it, and very few ever have, they feel as though they have arrived on another planet. The pictures you are about to see were taken by the last two Westerners invited by the Dalai Lama to visit his Shangri-La, far off Lhasa, by Lowell Jr. and myself. Ninety percent of them by the other Lowell. And if you would like to visit that strange land with us, come now as our caravan climbs the Himalayas. This land of the Lamas is almost entirely surrounded by parts of Asia that are themselves none too accessible. On the north and east, Xinjiang, Singhai, and Sikong, with their vast deserts and wild mountains. On the south, Assam, Bhutan, Sikkim, and Nepal, with Kashmir and Ladakh, Little Tibet, to the west. Within that ring, and still only partially explored, lies Inner Tibet, our destination. To get there, we must scale the Himalayas, greatest of all natural barriers. Not being nimble-footed yetis, abominable snowmen, instead of a frontal assault, we follow this narrow trail. On one side, the mountain wall. On the other, nothing, or so it appears. The start of a 24-day trek to Lhasa, only 300 miles, but every mile goes like this, for transportation here has no wheel. I wanted to bring a large expedition, including a professional camera crew. But the Tibetan government said no. Only my son and I. So we did all the photography ourselves. Down this stony trail for countless centuries have come Tibetan caravans bound for India. 
vet highway number one. First through a rainforest of bamboo and creepers for hours on end, with some variety now and then, like going down this ladder, a Tibetan escalator. It's the monsoon season on this side of the range, 250 inches of rain a season. My mule, and fortunately she is sure-footed, insists on taking the outer edge, on the brink, while Lowell wisely walks. we lose track of days, except that somehow I always seem to remember when it's Saturday. Whenever we pause, our porters fill their wooden bowls with barley flour, mixing it with water. Samba, they call it. The main diet in Tibet. Samba and yet buttered tea. As the days pass, we keep wondering, wondering why we've been permitted to enter Tibet when nearly all others have been denied. Only a handful of Westerners over a period of centuries. A dark bungalow built by the Indians greets us each evening, at least up to the Tibet-India border. And every morning we're reminded why it takes so long to cover those 300 miles to Lhasa. Tibetan asses are temperamental. If their loads don't balance, they sit down. Loading up can take hours, especially when mule driver Ugin Tenzin gets temperamental and sits down too. Ugin Tenzin's boss is the Sirdar, our head bearer. And our interpreter, Suwong Namyal, who lives in India and speaks some English. Yes, loading the pack animals is a problem, but another even bigger problem has to do with smaller animals. Aren't your whiskers beginning to itch a little too low? What loads these porters carry? Up to 200 pounds, climbing at great altitudes for a daily wage of about 50 cents, but actually worth a lot more to them. flags mark our first lofty Himalayan pass, Natu La, La meaning pass, at nearly 15,000 feet separating India from Tibet. With every flutter, prayers written on those frayed rags are wafted to Buddha. Inside Tibet now, the trail dropping down to the wild river Amo, and a bridge that is, well, at least interesting. Hardly like the George Washington or the Golden Gate. But a bridge is a bridge, and either you cross it or you don't. We did. Tibetan town, Yatung, with barley drying in the sun. Here we are greeted by a high official, the Rai Bahadur Sonam, with a turquoise pendant hanging from his ear, with a pearl in the middle. In the black costume of Yak Wo, the governor of Yatung, the Tromo Trochi of Domu, who stamps our passports with the Dalai Lama's seal, explaining that this has never happened before. At Yatung, we also meet our military escort, a lone corporal, 
the Chogpong. A good Buddhist, he carries a silver altar containing an image of Buddha. To him, an object far more important than a rifle. On his cap, a silver badge indicating his rank in the Tibetan army. Chogpong has our Lamyak, the Dalai Lama's permit commanding the people along the way to supply us with transport and shelter all the way from Yaptong, Domo, to Lhasa. Without the Lamyak, says the Rai Bahadur, we would get no farther. After Yaptong, the trail slants toward the sky again, up and up until we are behind the Himalayas. Some Westerners have tried this journey without the Dalai Lama's permit. Some have been killed for their pains. Even with permission, Lhasa is still far off. Many hazards still await us. a Chorten, a religious shrine, some so sacred that our men pause to offer prayers, prayers to pacify the evil spirits that inhabit this region. For Tibet's religion is a strange mixture of Buddhism and devil worship. Now out on the vast Tibetan plateau, we meet our first herd of yaks, the shaggy buffalo-like animal of Tibet. Yaks grazing on wild orchids. at the town of Fari, altitude 14,700 feet. Greeted by the local governor, Rimshi Doty, seven feet tall, who hands us silk scarves. They are the calling cards of Tibet. Rimshi Doty also offers presents of food, a butchered sheep, a sack of barley. For the next few days, as we parallel the mountains we have just crossed, we can hardly see the mountains because of the monsoon clouds. Most Tibetans are either nomads living in yak hair tents like these at the foot of sacred Mount Chomolari, or peasants who do their plowing with teams of yak using wooden plows and singing a song to frighten demons from the fields. Sunburned and weather beaten, the Tibetan peasant's only possessions are his stone hut, his herd, primitive tools and weapons, his family and his religion, and above all, a happy disposition. One fellow has pieces of bone in his hair to ward off demons. Hardly a day that we don't battle the monsoon floods. Not even Buddha can hold back the water. Tibet is a third the size of the United States. Population, at least three million, we don't know for sure. We find it completely futile. The land owned either by the nobility or by the church. Right for communism? Hmm, except for the power of Buddhism and the contentment of the people. Well, Lowell, you organized and ran the caravan. In fact, you did all the work. So how about doing a little of it now? Right. Maybe this is an appropriate time. 
Yancey is one place neither of us will ever forget, especially what happened to you on the return journey. Halfway to Lhasa, we entered Yancey, third largest town in Tibet, where we're welcomed by a monk official in silk robes and a lacquered hat. More silk scarves and more presents. Tibetans believe in reincarnation, so they spend much of their time praying for a brighter future. Round and round spins the prayer wheel. Om Mani Padmeyum, Om Mani Padmeyum. Hail, jewel in the lotus. Tibetan terriers, apsos. Beyond Yamsi, we stay with the peasants in their stone huts. Stone huts with no plumbing, no heating, no electricity, why they don't even have radio or television. We're at nearly 16,000 feet now, and in the distance, Yam Drokso, the turquoise lake. Then on to one of the world's largest rivers, the Brahmaputra. They call it Sang Po. And here we relax for a day in skin coracles. carries our recorder. What kind of skin are these coracles made out of? You guessed it, yak skin. Stretched over wooden ribs, lashed together with yak thong. And each coracle can carry the loads of more than 20 pack animals over a ton. Yet it is so light, the boatman can carry it back upstream on his shoulders. And at nighttime, he sleeps under it. We've landed at the town of Chussy, where they're threshing barley with a hand flail. One of the bells of Chussy has come to the river for her annual bath. Because of the severe climate, no bathing, except in summer. In the peasant homes where we stay overnight, the women do all the work. Weaving the wool and sifting the barley flour. Dad prepares for his next reincarnation. The rosary has been common here for centuries. Tibetan tea, so famous, is brewed in a wooden cylinder. Boiling water, soda, and tea leaves from China, plus juicy gobs of yak butter, usually rancid. What taste? What heavenly aroma. Only 40 more miles to Lhasa. Back home, we'd make that easily in an hour. But in the land of the Lamas, it takes us two and a half days. follow the Kichu, tributary of the Brahmaputra, and it's badly flooded. Amazing never to see a wheel on this trail. The only wheels we see in Tibet are prayer wheels. Some 
places, our animals detour into the rocks. With trails such as this, no wonder little from the world outside has ever penetrated this sealed and silent but happy land. Our porters unload the donkeys and yaks and carry everything themselves where the water is too deep and angry. If those black cases with our movie film had fallen in, well, you wouldn't be taking this trip with us. Almost every day we change porters and animals, so it's always payday. After nearly a month, we wonder if we'll ever reach our destination. But at last, we're deep in the land of lost horizons. Up this valley now is the El Dorado of all travel, Lawson. Your 30-year dream has come true, Dad. Can you believe it? I agree, it seems impossible. Here on the outskirts of the Dalai Lama's holy city, we are met by two officials who place more silk scarves across our wrists. Dorji Changwaba and Rimshi Kipu. They say they are to be our official hosts. Lhasa, at something over 12,000 feet, is low for Tibet. Population 20,000, plus 20,000 monks in nearby lamasaries. We found not a wheel in Lhasa. Tibetans understand the use of the wheel but long, long ago realized that even wagons would force them to convert their trails to roads, roads that would make it easier for outsiders to penetrate and then interfere with their peaceful seclusion. Crowds follow us, curious, as if we'd come from another planet. We happen to have arrived in Lhasa on the last day of the summer festival, when everyone is heading for the summer palace, Norbu Lingda. Members of the nobility riding gaily caparisoned mules and horses. Commoners on foot. Many women wearing wooden frames to support their long black hair. Frames studded with turquoise, coral, and seed pearls. Tibetans are of Mongolian origin, but far, far removed from the Chinese, both in race and culture. And they have their own language, totally unlike Chinese. The wealthy women of Lhasa, to safeguard their fair complexions, wear 12-inch sun visors. Each summer, the Dalai Lama puts on this festival. The climax of the summer season in Lhasa. About the only way these people can show their wealth is through their costumes. Women wear heavy turquoise jewelry, including charm boxes with talismans for good luck. The polite way to say hello stick out your tongue and hiss. Aprons with bands of color. Note the fair complexion of this noble woman. No schools for him. Inside the gateway at Norbulinga, high officials and lamas on their way to their box seats at the drama. Rounding the corner now, the Keshav, led by the Kalan Lama. The Keshav, top governing body below the Dalai Lama, 
endowed with all powers, legislative, executive, and judicial. Their long sleeves indicating that they are men of wisdom who do not work with their hands. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has come to the festival, but we are not permitted to see him. Not yet. Not until he grants us an audience. Lest we try, a towering monk keeps an eye on us, and the ground fairly trembles under his step. The drama tells how an incarnate Buddha sailed the ocean to recover sunken jewels, overcoming a host of evil spirits. A Central Asian pageant unchanged in a thousand years. As we look on, we can hardly believe that we are still on this planet. Today we find the same cast dancing in a monastery. policeman holds back the crowd with a stick, at times uh, beating them gently over the heads with it. Evil spirits the Lama must overcome. A drama never photographed before. And when Lowell walked on stage with the recorder, the actors were so distracted, they became speechless. But the audience whistled and cheered as though we were part of the act. The narrator who interrupts the drama to chant the story. contact with the Tibetan government is in a meeting with the two foreign ministers, one a monk on the left, Luishir Zaza Lama, and his lay colleague, Sirkong Zaza. Two men in every top job. They explain how their country had long been independent, and then they tell us about the impending Chinese invasion, which was to sweep into Tibet a few months later. From them, at last, we learn why we have been granted permission to come to Lhasa in order to take word of their plight to the Western world, which they've heard opposes communism, the red tide that they themselves so greatly feared. And from that august cabinet to Keshav, we learn why Red China wants Tibet, for strategic reasons. Tibet borders on India for nearly 2,000 miles. Control of the roof of the world gives China access to the Hindustan Peninsula and its half a billion inhabitants. A backward, undeveloped country? Not at all. We find it has its own special civilization and a rich culture, which becomes more apparent as we watch an artist at work on a tanka. A religious painting could be hung in a monastery surrounded by flickering butter lamps. He makes his own paints from crushed rock. Teacups of hand-wrought silver and gold. And the average Tibetan consumes around 50 cups of yak butter tea each day.
Several miles north of Lhasa is the largest monastery in the world, Drepong, meaning rice heap. And that's what it looks like from a distance. Drepong, the home of 10,000 monks and lamas. The lamas, some of them, living Buddhas. Its temples crowned with turrets of gold. And where does all the gold come from? They say imported from India and China. Although the Himalayas probably are rich in minerals, there had been little mining in Tibet because that would anger the gods. From a gold-encrusted roof, a conch shell horn sounds the call to prayer. Monks singing gather below where a pilgrim is prostrating himself. Doing this day after day for a month, from dawn to dusk, to win merit. An easier way, just spin the barrels crammed with prayers and hurry them along to Buddha. Use the firstborn son and every family becomes a monk. If you were the lucky one, you could look forward to no wife, no alcohol, just life in a monastery, a life of meditation and prayer. Some of Dredpung's 10,000 getting their daily ration of barley flour, while a lama croaks out a double bass blessing. The lords of the land, and they live on barley. Over this huge lamasery are the head abbots, never before photographed, flanked by proctors, monastery disciplinarians, each with a golden mace. Ranging in age from 65 to 90, these men are the power behind the Dalai Lama. By the way, they believe that there are many incarnate Buddhas throughout the world, unrecognized of course, but all doing good work for mankind in many countries. It's estimated there are several hundred thousand monks and lamas in Tibet, about one quarter of the male population. The golden splendor of Lamaistic Buddhism, a combination of primitive Tibetan beliefs and the doctrine of eternal Buddha leading mankind to the everlasting peace of nirvana. Reincarnation, the soul going from one life to another until finally dissolved into the infinite. A drop falling into the ocean of eternity. Nirvana, the Buddhist heaven. Ilya Tolstoy and Brooke Dolan Two of the eight Americans, including ourselves, ever invited to Lhasa. U.S. Army officers on a secret mission in World War II. First Americans to witness the Tibetan New Year Festival. The only film ever made of that rare pageant. Reenactment of a legendary battle by soldiers in 16th century metal helmets and ancient coats of mail. driven off by blasts from antique matchlocks. Enter the jolly god of wealth, escorted to his seat of honor. An old man overpowers a tiger, reenacting the dream of a late Dalai Lama, proving again the indomitable strength of humanity. Devil dancers representing evil forces.
gradually the devils are subdued and all evil spirits are forced into this cauldron of boiling oil for the villains a last cup of wine before a fiery death. Now it's safe for the cavalry to ride out of the holy city. Tibetan lancers, armed and clad in armor, just as they were hundreds of years ago. Knights of the Dalai Lama's Round Table. Festival is slightly more up to date. A competition between cavalrymen at full gallop, aiming for a bullseye with bows and muskets. Now let's meet the Tibetan ruler's family, the Dalai Lama's mother, brothers, and sisters. In the background, his fabulous winter palace. Song, the happy one. On the right, no relation. The Dalai Lama's mother has gold medallions on the back of her dress. A Lhasa woman burns incense and leaves prayer flags on a mountain top where we've come for a better view of the Dalai Lama's towering Lhasa Palace, the Potala. Built in the 17th century, entirely by hand, no steel, the Potala, a soaring mass of red and white masonry. Potala means palace of the gods, like an enchanted castle in the clouds, the real Shangri-La. its roof, gold crypts of departed Dalai Lamas. Inside, more than 1,000 rooms. Just under the roof, the Dalai Lama's winter quarters. A stone staircase on the southern face. Several years ago, an official guilty of treason was dragged by his heels down those stairs to his death. the valley the medical college where monks learn how to dispense herbs and how to blow horns made of human bone horns to frighten away the evil spirits of disease Tibetan God King at Norbulinga. Our companions telling us that no Dalai Lama had ever been filmed. Also that he had met few visitors from the outside world. Spiritual lightning rods of gold on the temple roof. Green griffins in the courtyard. Ferocious masters. the towering monk bodyguard that gives us a going over. On the roof, incense and thundering horns. Then into the temple, and there before us, the Dalai Lama, reincarnation of Chenrezig, the living Buddha of mercy. His Holiness steps into a shaft of sunlight with his Lord Chamberlain. At 15, he became absolute spiritual and temporal ruler of all Tibet. 
highest ranking Lama in the Buddhist world. Once again, His Holiness would pose for us, this time on an outdoor throne, surrounded by flowers and members of his household. In the Dalai Lama's lap is a plaque, a symbol of office, head of Lamaism. Of course, he can never marry. Tibetans believe that when their ruler dies, then he is reincarnated somewhere else in Tibet, reincarnated in the body of a newborn boy. And they believe that they can find him. But this sometimes takes three or four years. He seems immensely curious about the travelers who have come so far to see him, the Tibetan living God of mercy. Standing alongside the 73-year-old regent, Tokra, who a few weeks after our departure turned all power over to the young Dalai Lama. soon our short stay in Lhasa comes to an end. The number one high adventure of our lives. With deadlines to make back home, we shove off down the Kyuchu in our yak skin boats. Friends waving a final salute as we take our final look at Shangri-La. Traveling with the current this time, it takes just six hours to cover those 40 miles to the Sangpo, the Brahmaputra, in contrast to the two and a half days coming in. Later, crossing the river, our caravan animals have to swim. And are they frightened? Now we're approaching a 17,000 foot pass. One I'll long remember. Lowell, this is where the evil spirits caught up with me. Those mountain devils. Yes, here's where you lost that argument with your horse. We had been walking, and when remounting, nobody was holding his half-wild horse. It might have been like this, but instead the horse whirled, throwing him into the rocks where he broke his hip, smashed it in eight places. Hours later, Word reached our porters who had taken a shortcut. They unpacked a sleeping bag and a cot on which we carried him to a village some miles away. There he spent a sleepless night of agony. In the morning, I sent word to the nearest large town asking for help. That was Gyansi, fortunately headquarters of one of two doctors in all Tibet. Dr. Paul, an Indian, who actually wasn't a doctor. But he brought morphine, a splint, and a stretcher. Now we start slowly down the trail on a four-day trek to Gyamsi. My father strapped to the litter in a sleeping bag with a tarpaulin across the back to shield him from rain and sun. All during this painful ride, his spirits are high but there must have been many times when he wondered if he would ever leave Tibet. Without an x-ray machine, we could only guess what had happened to his hip. How fortunate, because had we known that it was broken in eight places, we wouldn't have dared move him this way. The risk was too great. To wait in Gansi for his hip to mend would mean many months. Now, however, it's October. Already there's new snow on the mountains. And any day those passes home will be closed. So we make this crude sedan chair and get Tibetans to carry it, beginning a march of 16 more days on to India. through 
streams, over the lofty plateau, and finally across the Himalayas. The porters working in teams of four, shifting every half hour. Always two teams with us. The Red Idol Gorge with its huge Buddha. Sometimes the trail is so narrow that to move that chair around a corner, we have to tip it on edge. The porters carry their heavy load with thin yak straps across their shoulders. The chair alone weighs over 100 pounds. The best speed they could make was between one and two miles an hour. And any day they covered as much as 12 miles, we thought that a miracle. To keep in step, our porters sing and chant all day long. One chant was a bit disconcerting. It translated, O oh Lord Buddha, lighten our load. Their prayers were answered too, for on the way out, Dad lost 25 pounds. Bounce, bounce, bounce. Hour after painful hour, day after painful day. And the nights were even worse, for he could hardly sleep. Did someone say, hi, adventure? Well, it's been high, all right, here on the roof of the world. But with these 20 agonizing days, it's been almost too much adventure. Yes, carried for 20 days across the Tibetan plateau, and then over the highest mountains in the world. Occasionally, I relive some of those moments in my dreams. But I was lucky. My son got me out of that one with the aid of the Tibetans and the Indians. And then I was fortunate when I got home. Tibet, as we know, is a land where they believe in miracles and America, a country where they perform them. And after a month, I was operated on by a wizard American surgeon who fixed me up perhaps better than ever. But what about Tibet and its future? Will those freedom-loving people ever regain their freedom? Will Tibet retain its out-of-this-world charm? Questions difficult to answer. Fervently do we hope that the Tibetans someday will regain their own destiny. So long.